In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when he heard his name called over the loudspeaker, echoing through the hallways of his high school, he thought to himself, well, that's, that's probably not good. When he heard not just his name, but that his presence was requested in the principal's office, he thought to himself, well, that's definitely not good. He wasn't the, the biggest rule breaker in the school. He always had a, a degree or two of separation between himself and the real hooligans. He was more of a, a rule bender, not a rule breaker. You probably know the type. But still, as his feet crossed the threshold into the office, his mind started to race. What could he possibly want to talk to me about? Does he somehow know about this? Am I about to finally get into trouble for that? And so he walks into the office, and before the principal can say a single word, he opens his mouth, and out comes this confession of all the shenanigans he'd been a party to throughout the course of his high school years. Cascading out of his mouth come tales of pranks and parties, white lies told and classes skipped, and on and on and on, until finally he, he, he's done. And the principal can only sit there in stunned silence at this confession before he finally tells the young man why he called him in in the first place. You've been selected as an honorary student of the semester, and here's your award. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what it is about being in the presence of authority that causes so many of us to start confessing things. Maybe you've been uh, stopped by a police officer, and you've heard that, that classic question, do you know why I pulled you over today? And you can't help but think to yourself, well, that depends on how long you've been following me. <laughs> I know I rolled through that stop sign a few blocks back, and uh, I haven't really used my turn signal much for the last two years or so, and pretty much every time I get behind the wheel, the speed limit is more of a speed suggestion. What is it about being in the presence of authority that makes us just start confessing things? I think it certainly has something to do with the fact that figures of authority are supposed to know right from wrong. After all, they're the ones enforcing right and wrong. And so if we know we're in the wrong, we think that it's probably painfully obvious to them too, even though that's maybe not always the case. How do you think Isaiah felt in that Old Testament reading that we had? Because he wasn't called to the principal's office as a high schooler, and he wasn't chatting with uh, local law enforcement outside of his window. No, instead, he found himself before the presence of ultimate authority and perfect power. And he describes the scene like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, angels, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. These words are barely able to describe the scene that Isaiah witnesses. Can you even start to imagine it, that, that God himself, the creator of the universe, is seated before you on this high and exalted throne, his robe so great it fills this immense space of the temple. And then you have these billows of smoke obscuring the scene, difficult to see through, signifying his glory. And then you have the angels flying overhead, shouting out praises so loudly that the floor underneath you, the very foundations of the temple, are shaking. And in the middle of this whole sort of chaotic scene is Isaiah. Probably feeling about this big. Definitely feeling out of place. It's painfully obvious that, that one of these things is not like the other, and it's, it's Isaiah. As if he'd, he'd chosen to wear flip-flops and a tank top to an opera house. It's not good. When the angels cry out, holy, 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 though, they're not stuck on repeat. They're, they're trying to say something to Isaiah and also to us, too. They're trying to tell us something about God and about us as human beings. To be holy means to be set apart from something, to be, to be separated. 
And so when these angels pile one holy after another, what they're trying to say is just how separate God is, just how fundamentally distant God is as holy and perfect from anything and anyone who is sinful. What these angels are saying is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, and you, Isaiah, and you, sinful human people, you are not. You are fundamentally distant from this God. And that's a problem. And so confronted with the, the unveiled, the unmistakable holiness of God, Isaiah comes to the only conclusion that he could actually come to, and that's to fall on his knees and confess, woe to me, I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King. My eyes have seen the Lord Almighty, a sinner in the presence of perfection, and I cannot stand when you are confronted with that holy, holy, holiness of God, what do you say? If you're like me, you try to find someone to compare yourself to who at least outwardly seems to be a worse sinner. So you look like you're in a little bit better light. Or maybe you try to defend your bad decisions or, or justify your, your poor judgment calls. Maybe you try to, to make up, promise that you're going to make up those sins with, with good deeds in the past, try to balance out that scale. But no matter what we try to tell ourselves, that doesn't change the fact that God is holy, and just like Isaiah, we are not. And that is certainly a problem. Confronted with the awesome holiness of God, really the only thing that we can do is confess right along with Isaiah Woe to us. We are ruined because we too are a people of unclean lips. But we can't stop there. Jesus says in the Gospels that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we have to confess that not only are we people of unclean lips, but we're also people of unclean hands and unclean minds and unclean hearts. When we stand before the King of Kings in the presence of his holiness and perfection, all of our flaws, all of our sins are laid bare. Every lustful idea, every idle word, every hateful thought, they all become as plain as the nose on your face when we're standing in God's presence. But does God's holiness only elicit a confession? Or does it bring about something else? You see, when we talk about the different characteristics of God, one of the important questions that we should ask is this. Is this good for me or is this bad for me? Is this good news or bad news? Is this comforting or is this terrifying? Is this law or is this gospel? Let's take a look at a couple other examples. Uh, when the Bible says that God is present everywhere, is that good for me or is that bad for me? In a way, it's good for you, right? That means God is present. He's with you through the thick and thin of life. No matter what's happening, you have the presence of the Almighty God to comfort you. But on the other hand, that also means that God is there when we actively turn our backs on him in favor of giving in to those temptations, those sins. What about when the Bible talks about how God knows all things? Is that good for me? Is that bad for me? In a sense, it's good because that means God knows exactly what I need and when I need it and, and how to get it to me. But that also means that God knows those deepest, darkest, most closely kept secret sins that I harbor in my heart. So, what about the characteristic of God that we look at today? What about his holiness? Is that good for me or bad for me? Is that comforting or is that terrifying? And the fact of the matter is, it's both. It's absolutely both. God's holiness is both law and gospel. It's both comfort and warning. It's both killing and making alive again. And maybe that, that sort of paradox is, is difficult to understand because what do comfort and warning have to do with each other? What do killing and making alive again have to do with each other? They seem to be complete opposites. How can these two seemingly incompatible characteristics of God come together? Where can they meet that makes sense? And the only answer is at the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to earth to show us that God is holy. 
by dying on the cross for the sins of the entire world. And that includes your sins and my sins. At the cross, God exercised his perfect, holy judgment against sin. But instead of pouring out his righteous wrath on the sinner, he instead chose to pour it out on his sinless son. And in that action, God not only shows his holiness and his justice, but he also shows his love and the forgiving nature that he has towards sinners. Sin was paid for by the Savior so that God's forgiveness could rain down on the saved. And that instead of condemning you and I to the hell that our sins earned for us, God instead paved the way to heaven where we get to be with him forever through the work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all this is brought to you free of charge by God's grace, preached in your ear and planted in your heart by his Holy Spirit through the word. See, God is holy, no doubt about it. But his holiness is not just a holiness that condemns the sinner. It's a holiness that saves the sinner. Watch what happens with Isaiah after he is 100% crushed by being in the presence of God's holiness. He says, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. It's incredible. It's incredible that, that God is so just that he demands full payment for sin, and yet he himself picks up the tab. Christ, through his perfect life and innocent death, has wiped away your guilt and removed your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. Through Jesus, your sins are forgiven, they are forgotten, and that is forever. And that's grace. That's God's undeserved love that led a holy God to declare you and me holy in his sight. Isaiah was expecting to feel the, the backhand of God's wrath for being a sinner standing in the presence of a sinless God. But instead, what he received was the warm embrace of a loving father. And so when God asks for a messenger, someone who would take the message of this grace out to more people, what else could Isaiah do? God says, uh, or Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah went from woe to go because he's so overwhelmed with the undeserved love of God that he could think of nothing else to do except share that grace with as many people as possible. That's the whole purpose of the school that I represent, Michigan Lutheran Seminary, the whole purpose of our sister high school, Luther Prep, the whole purpose of, of the college and the seminary is to encourage and prepare and train young men and women to go and do as Isaiah did. Now, at MLS as a high school, the, the kids are far from perfect, as you can imagine, but every day they get to hear that wonderful news of the gospel. They get to be reminded of the, the grace God gave them in baptism. They get refreshed in their faith from his word. They renew their strength to serve him that day and also to consider how they can serve him in the future. Many of our students go on to Martin Luther College and Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary where they get to echo the words of Isaiah. The words of, here am I, send me. And God does send them to be pastors and teachers and staff ministers, to be those people that Paul wrote about who equip God's people for works of service to build up the church, to be one, to be united in Christ. And the students that, that choose other lives, it doesn't really matter where God puts them on the path of life. He's going to give them opportunities to serve the church. He's going to give them opportunities to live as children of God who have been made holy through the blood of Jesus. So that no matter where our students come from, no matter where they go, they'll be able to be like Isaiah, to share the grace that's been given to them with the people in their little corner of the kingdom. That's the privilege our students have. And that's also the privilege that you have as well. Because like Isaiah, every day, every time you hear the gospel, you can be overwhelmed by the undeserved love that God has for each and every one of you. Now you may be thinking at this point, Surely God can find a better messenger than me to take this grace out to the world. 
And you know what? You're right. He could find better messengers than you. He could find better messengers than me too. But he chooses to use you. See, God uses the unlikely means of his word, something that's subtle but still powerful, the gospel in word and sacrament, not flashy, but it gets the job done. And he also uses people like that too, subtle, not flashy, but they share the word and then get out of the way and let it do its work of creating and strengthening faith. That's what we can take from this account from Isaiah is that we have been freely forgiven through God's grace, that we can stand before a holy God because he now sees us as holy through his son, but we can also speak that grace that has been given to us. So the encouragement for you today is to do just that, to speak. I'm sure you know someone in your life who would benefit from hearing that Jesus has done everything for them and that they need to do nothing. Speak. Invite them to come here to hear what you get to hear every single week. I'm sure you know someone in your life who feels shackled by the shame of their past, who feels completely and utterly unlovable. Speak. Tell them about the Savior who came to break their chains to free them for lives of service, who came to love especially the unlovable. And I know that you have a church who wants to take that message of grace to your community. So speak. Jump into the ministry opportunities that God gives you right here in Covington. And if you can't jump in yourself, then there are plenty of other ways to support the ministry that helps spread the grace of God to more and more people. Speak like Isaiah. But as you're speaking, remember why you're speaking. It's not because you have to. It's because holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And through faith in Jesus, you are holy now too. Amen. Please stand.